Welcome to the Inside Silverstone podcast, a business-focused podcast covering all things tech, engineering and innovation. Hosted by me, Chris Broom, a huge tech, motorsport and gaming fan, and also the owner of Longhurst, a firm of lifestyle financial planners and independent financial advisors located in Silverstone, Northamptonshire. This is a series of unscripted and unpolished conversations with leading business owners, thought leaders and high-tech talent where we discuss their experiences within the Silverstone business and motorsport region. We will also be asking them to share their knowledge, insight and their thoughts on the future just for you. If you're looking to learn more about the Silverstone high growth region and commercially connect with like-minded peers, you've definitely come to the right place. Welcome to Inside Silverstone. Welcome to the next edition of Inside Silverstone. My name is Chris Broom and I am your host. Today I am delighted to host Mastermind Sessions number three, which we have titled The Future of Mobility. Uh, I have four wonderful guests with me today, so thank you all for coming. But before we start, I must say one thing. Happy birthday, Sally. It's Sally's 21st birthday today. She doesn't want to show off that she's still 21, but happy birthday. Thank you. And thank you very much for obviously coming on this podcast on a day of your birth. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Still alive. <laughs> still alive. <laughs> Result. The right side of the ground. Happy days. Right. So before we get into the questions, um, I would love you all to sort of introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, who you work for and what you specialise in. So our wonderful listeners and also everyone viewing through YouTube and other means get to know who you guys are. So I'm going to start with this handsome young man over here. Oh, look over that way. <laughs> yeah, well, good morning. My name is Mike Hayward and I'm a solicitor from Woodfines in Milton Keynes, Cambridge and Bedford. But I specialise in all things with wheels in essence. So trucks, lorries, coaches, um, and cars, of course. So I'm keeping at the forefront of seeing what's going on with law, um, connected in particular with autonomous vehicles. But we represent individuals, companies, making sure that they're compliant, that they're complying with all of the road regulations, but in essence to preserve their reputations, but also to promote their businesses. We get compliance right, lots of other good business flows from that. And I'm also very close to Silverstone Tech Cluster, and obviously I've worked with you in, in respect of a number of matters, so very pleased to be here. Great, thank you, Mike. Uh, birthday girl? Uh, so I'm Sally Pavlotsky. Um, so currently I'm here at David Brown Automotive as the Operations Director. Uh, but my normal hat is obviously high voltage EV. Um, uh, very, I'm not sure if the word is proud, but I uh, created the um, electric E type um, uh, when I was at JLR. And obviously that has created the movement of a classic conversion thing. So converting mm. um, combustion cars is a really thing close to my my heart of uh, carbon neutrality. Um, I've also done vehicle development for some micro mobility stuff. Um, obviously very keen interest in ADAS 345, uh, autonomy generally, and all that kind of gubbins obviously involved with the tech cluster here mm-hmm. at Silverstone. Yep. Um, and feel that within the golden triangle, um, we've got a really good reputation here for really setting those um, guidelines and obviously not, not just in law where we're way ahead than most countries at the moment, um, but in technology and innovation, which is obviously what British engineering does best. Here, here. Yeah. And who are you? So yeah, hello, uh, Luke Rust. I'm head of commercial development at uh, a small little technology company called uh, Immense Simulations, based in Milton Keynes, been going about three years now. Uh, what we do is build simulated worlds So a simulated version of uh, Milton Keynes and then use that to test new futures for mobility and transportation systems. Some of the cool stuff we're working on is is helping Addison Lee and Oxbotica deploy autonomous vehicle fleets in London over the next three or four years with the hope that that becomes a commercial service for customers uh, in that region. Other stuff we do is help people like Highways England, uh, Network Rail understand the impact of um, disaster scenes and stuff like that on their network. Mm. What do you do when this train goes down or this road goes down? Where does everyone go in that world? So that's what Immense do. Uh, My background's uh, energy side uh, and automotive as well, so helping automotive folks understand the impact of electrification on manufacturing, but then also going forward into into the new world of mobility. So yeah, that's me. Okay, <laughs> great intro. 
And yourself? Well, yeah, uh, difficult acts to follow, I think. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm Chris Kirby. I'm the CEO of a company called Tomorrow's Journey. We're an even smaller technology company, but also based in uh, Milton Keynes. We're just over a year old. Um, our platform is aimed at uh, allowing uh, vehicles and assets to be used more effectively, uh, particularly in the mobility space. So um, allowing one vehicle to be accessed by multiple providers at the same time. Um, so a lot of software and uh, other bits and pieces sitting behind that, but also some of the operational side as well. Um, my background is uh, pretty much all automotive. Um, Work for a number of the OEMs, also work for JLR. I feel like everyone in this space has at one stage or another. We've all got the scars. We've all got the scars for <laughs> it. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm, a, I'm an auto guy, I guess, uh, a, a kind of yeah, going, going back. Um, but yeah, started uh, this business 12 months ago. Uh, also proud members of the uh, STC. Uh, so yeah, excited for today. It's going to be a good, good discussion. Great. And thank you all for, for being present. And so we, we, prior to this recording, we sort of ran through a number of questions that we might want to discuss. Uh, one that I've got is, you know, regarding wh whether it's, uh, you know, electric vehicles, EV or autonomous, you know, wh what is the public sort of demand and want for these at the moment? We're clearly, you know, uh, combustion engine supported at the moment. There's a little bit of e e e electric vehicle, you know, starting with sort of Prius through to, to obviously JLR through to others. You know, is there a growing demand for, for EV? And then is there actually then going to be sort of an evolution into autonomous? Because autonomous, for me, feels a little bit scary. It's like, you know, is it going to be safe? Which I know we're going to discuss from a legal perspective and otherwise. You know, what does the general public want? Because one thing, you know, the experts and the manufacturers thinking this is where it needs to be. But what about sort of Joe, average public, who's, you know, got his day job and his family? So I think, so I've done quite a lot of focus groups which are always joyful things to do. Mm. Um, but I think that the difference now is that um, media is our best friend, okay, which, which you don't say very often. Um, but um, the if you look at the adoption of EV acceptance, so um, when we did the Electric Defender, I think it was about seven or eight years ago, it, everyone was like, ooh, you know, crazy. And, and the Prius was a bit left-wing and, yeah, but great for taxis, so about avoiding, you know, congestion charges and things like that. But it's, I think now with... With the fact that we have got this ticking time bomb, which is this, you know, IPCC, you know, turned around and said, we have 12 years to lower the global temperature by, what is it, 1.5 degrees, but now they think a lot more. Otherwise, we get into the irreversible effect, mm -hmm. so El Nino and all that kind of stuff. I think that there is a swathe of movement that is being educated by key influencers, social media, you know, lots of TV shows, obviously good old David Attenborough. You've got Greta from Sweden. There's lots of people now constantly pushing the message and one of the things that people then ask is i hear a lot is i really like the idea of getting an electric car but is it going to make a massive difference sure. and i think that is actually the question that people are asking which is so those with disposable incomes that can afford it and it's cool and it's trendy and it's you know like the iWatch but your phone your tesla's what that you'll always get those sales but the other question people are asking is will it make a difference mm. so i think the questions are being asked. There is a, a, a global awareness. You know, countries are making very bold statements about when they will stop allowing new cars that are ICE, so internal combustion engine, to be sold. Mm -hmm. um, some countries a lot more sooner than others. I think we're 2040, but is it France then 2021? And China's just you know throwing billions of, of, of at their country all the time. So yes, I think there is a swathe of movement which is I'm interested, you know, but how does it suit my means? I can't, yeah, there's that whole thing, I can't afford one because they can't quite see that the micro mobility, does it fit our lifestyles? Mm. You know, does it fit the way we move? Um, I think the bigger discussion point beyond that is I think there's an acceptance. I don't think there's, there's been no resistance. And we've got to remember electric cars have been here since 1832. This is not new. Uh, you know, just the first time around, unfortunately, Ford killed the electric car. Uh, and now we're starting all over again. Um, is the reality is we need to look at how we live. Mm -hmm. So it's not about, it's not, we need to look how we move, we need to look how we live, and it's a much bigger question than what are you moving in. So, yeah, and it should just go on forever. It really is a fishing conversation. Uh, because, <laughs> because it's just, it is such a vast, I mean, as you guys know, when you're looking at a simulated world, we're looking at the world we're in right now. But the reality is we have to stop people moving because even if we switch people from IC vehicles into EVs, the whole supply chain, the way that we build cars, there's still a carbon issue and an emissions issue all the way up to the point that that car is then on the road. Mm. They're still mostly being powered by bur burning dinosaurs. The re reality is we don't have enough renewables to power electric cars, we don't have enough charge points, we don't have enough infrastructure. So... There is an acceptance. I think the public is game. We have to really, as engineers, you know, technology leaders, look at how can we make it cheaper and where should we focus our efforts? Because moving people is nowhere near as 
emitting, you know, as, as, mm. as you know, carbon issues as moving goods uh, and stuff, or even down to just A4 pieces of paper around London on motorbikes, you know, um, and looking at how we live and where we live in the air we live in and the spaces that we, that we grow in. Yeah, I completely agree. I think there's definitely um, a pull towards EV. You know, people are looking at Elon Musk, looking at what Tesla are doing. Suddenly electric vehicles are sexy and people mm. want to have them. We're all kind of waiting for the next generation of EV. You know, are they going to be affordable? Can we, you know, adapt our lifestyle to accommodate them? And does that make it easier for us to, to live and be? Mm. And then you've got the push. You know, we are starting to hit the OEMs with targets they've got to meet. So they are going to transition their, you know, the vehicles they're pushing out to, to electric. And we're going to have a whole suite of new EV um, on the road. No, are they going to be cheap enough again? Does it does it suit the customers? Do the people want to be doing that? Mm. And some of the stuff we discussed previously is, you know, I completely agree the point towards how do we efficiently move people and goods around cities? Does EV actually slow the transition to mobility services mm. because we're just increasing people to um, go and buy the next car, which yeah. is then locked in for another 10 years or whatever until they, they want to change it again? So, yeah. There's, there's, there's a, a bit key. around the, the supply element of it as well. I think it's worth, worth considering because I think you've got that at the tip in adoption, which I think like the next 12 months with the new range of vehicles that are coming in, when you've got the option and interesting, I don't know if you guys saw the episode of Top Gear last night, or when this is going out, but from last night when we're recording it, um, where they, it was focused on EV and they did a whole episode around it and they did a whole thing of basically doing the usual thing, slagging off how long it takes to charge, the range, everything else. But then they test drove the Model 3 against the rivals in that sector and basically just went, why would you buy a BMW 3 Series or, um, or a C-Class Mercedes? And that's going to be the question, is in that sector now you would buy a tesla model 3 the problem is they're not going to be able to build them fast enough to get in there so so then there's a question of how, how do you do it then the price becomes a thing then it becomes an elitist thing it doesn't really necessarily mm. solve a solve a problem and then there's a question about so should electric vehicles or a proportion of them be shared mm. so instead of actually people who have five cars on their drive replacing their five internal combustion cars with electric cars actually should we be putting them in a shared pool and, mm. and thinking how we use the ones that we can build better because otherwise you're just creating a different environmental challenge. But is a household of wealth going to want to do that? I'm just thinking, you know, if they've got those five cars and logically they move them to an EV because they can afford to do so otherwise and, you know, their 18-year-old who's just passed their test has got one, are they then going to want to put them into, you know, an environment where I think people... that's what I mean. It's about whether you yeah, whether so. that becomes part of legislation, right? You say, yeah. uh, well, when the EVs, of all EVs that are imported, X percentage should have to go into a shared some kind of shared network or some kind of shared mm. pool because otherwise they're just going to be bought by people basically who won't use them very often and the people yeah. who do the most miles are going to end up sitting driving their ICEs because that's all they can afford. Well, from, to. For the manufacturers it's still small margins on these on these yeah. vehicles yeah. You know, so they still want to push them out at scale so it's a real balance between how do you yeah push them into mobility services and reduce um, ownership of vehicles but for the manufacturers it's a very difficult challenge if you're not you can't deliver at the scale that you previously but, I mean, had society that. want that sort of more disposable way these days so when you're speaking to young people they're not so interested in long-term car ownership so i think shared vehicles is going to be the way forward if you think there's what over 38 million cars registered in, yeah. on the, on the roads and actually only a very small percentage of the time are they actually being used four or five percent of the time when you take into account when they're parked or they're at work they're on your drive so actually there's going to be an education and i think actually younger people ethically feel that there's a need to reduce certain um, fossil fuel usage but ultimately they want that education if the if the manufacturers can make it very easy that disposable culture that we're in so cars being delivered cheap enough shared i think that's the way it's going to be it's about balancing the business models as well, right? So if, if you say to someone, hey, you would pay £500 a month for your BMW and now you pay £500 a month for a Tesla, unless you said, well, you could pay £500 a month for a Tesla, but you have to wait two years for it, or you could pay £200 a month to share one and it's available tomorrow. It's those types of things that start to make people think differently. Um, and it's just how that comes about. And we have to live differently. Yeah, yeah Because sure. the reality is, is if we continue to all live the lives we have, like, you know, I could commute 45 miles each way every day, used to 120 each way, you know, the reality is, is I'm not making any difference if I'm in a, I'm in a hybrid at the moment because an EV can't do what I need it to do. Plus, it's way too expensive for what I need. Um, you know, but my primary car, family car, is still a diesel SUV because it does what I need to do. And it's carbon neutral now. Like, if we got to the point where, you know, the governments are just trying to tick boxes with the IPCC and, and, and fly big global flags and go, but we're the greenest country ever, you know, we're going to be less green overall because what do you do with 38 million cars? 
Yeah, how because can you get rid of 38 million cars? You can't. That's a lot of cars to get rid of. Which is why, in my view, and that's one of the reasons, you know, looking at plug and play EV systems, if you look at the way that engineers design cars, from you know the good old British Leyland days to today, you have commonality of platform, mm. which is why when you look at cars at the moment, you've got you know an I pace is basically an F pace and an E pace mixed together, and ta-da, because you have to amortise all those costs, right? So you amortise across the platform. Well, it applied for about thirty odd years. Most British cars, so for example, the Mini is a great example. So the Mini twelve ninety five CC shares an architecture with Riley, Metro, um, Mooks all sorts of stuff, Austins, you know, if you can create one power pack for one car, just to give a mean average of maybe 120, 140 mile range, which is enough for most people in a day, you could convert any car on the road. So are we not better than, as you say, because the supply chain is a whole nother painful discussion of decades and decades of work to neutralize that supply chain. And that's the bit the customer, as you say, doesn't see. Yeah. If you could convert a current car, you know, and yeah, because things naturally die. But if your chassis sounds and you can stick a battery pack in it for sub five grand rather than new engine and gearbox, that's way better for the environment. In my, I, I'm a big convert things. Yeah, Obviously, yeah. that's why. Well, I that's what a lot of the Top Gear thing was about yesterday. And again, they did it in typical, slightly ridiculous fashion, but they were yeah. converting older cars into EVs, trying to make an EV. And they proved that they couldn't do it because yeah. it was you know, done for, for entertainment. Oh. But there was a real thing about whether yeah. you could start to, to do some of that stuff. And it's about doing it safely and under yeah. some legislative guidance because obviously when we created um, uh, the electric E-Type, we did it very much to an OEM standard documentation, safety sign-off. There are now lots of companies jumping up and I, I wouldn't like to cast aspersions, hence why my nickname's Marmite, but um, you know, there are some very scary things going on um, with wrecked EVs, old Prius cells, stuff like that. The, the nice thing now is you can go and pick up a catalogue from most tier one suppliers and you can get most things that you need in a good level from Bosch, um, you know, Continental, um, NVIDIA and stuff like that, where you can design stuff yeah. using OEM parts to get a really, really good car. Um, but for me, the future is, you're absolutely right, young people, shared transport, massive legal issue over then if it crashes, who's got the liability. Um, but we just have to change the way we live. We have to accept we have technology, we can work from home more. Therefore, you How long is that going to take to be able to shift from what, where we currently are into, into a position, as you're saying? I mean, how, how long is that going to take to it's transition? It's pretty irrational. You know, folks, yeah. it's, it's difficult to encourage behavioural change. You sure. Know, yes, we, we can talk about climate change, but people kind of see it as this this issue that doesn't really affect my day to day life. How can yeah. we make it? You know, a real real issue for. It's got to be price. accessible. It's got to be affordable. Still, manufacturers are bombarding with advertising of one nine nine a month to get into a certain vehicle. You'll see that more with petrol and diesel models as opposed to EV vehicles. The reality is it's got to be affordable, it's got to be accessible. And of course, the shift then is, is to change your vehicle every three years. So what's happening with all of that? I do question how many people are keeping their cars like we did. And I'm looking at minis out in the factory today. I kept my mini for several years. I wish I still had it, actually, because they are <laughs> taking on growth <laughs> yeah, value. But, but ultimately, it's this disposable world. Yeah. And each of those cars are going back onto the market after three years. So manufacturers are driving home, selling new vehicles mm -hmm. and leasing new vehicles. But what's happening with the old ones? Yeah, and there's a real legacy years. of that. And we will know, you know OEM backgrounds. And I used to work in the, you know, the commercial side of things for, for JLR and for Fiat. And, and they're throwing vehicles in. Those new deals are to keep the factories moving, to keep vehicles in. And, and people are... People who were buying two or three year old vehicles before are now buying new ones, but that means there's no one to buy. So there's a whole thing in there that's a bit of a mess already. And I think when you start throwing in the EV element, if there are um, cheaper and better EVs coming in at the top end, then what's going to happen to these vehicles at the bottom? Is it another pressure on those? Yeah, where do um, they go? Where do they go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's going to happen? And, and I think the thing is, if you imagine it's a massive dartboard and the outer rings are like, you know, if the, if the center is, is you know, B to C transport, you know, our car ownership models. However, those models change. But if you start at the outside, so you know, if if we could have solar powered freight ships, and you can have you know electric uh, planes, which obviously aren't that far off now. Boeing and I've just launched a, a big deal um, with um, with an EV company. Um, then you start to get into inner city cargo, so your transit vans converting those or putting them out. Obviously, Nissan have got a really good cargo van now. Then all the way down to tuk tuks, you know, mopeds and bicycles. Mm -hmm. That's a huge amount of emissions that you've dealt with. People, so just us moving around, you know, our cars are sat for 93% of the time. We're only using them, we're using them very minimally, hence where the car sharing stuff is great, but it's, 
it's a, a massive culture Bar shift. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think there's a willingness, there's an openness. People are listening. People mm-hmm. are making change in their everyday lives. You know, if you think about the things, you know, people, characters like David Attenborough. You know, there's now straws banned. You know, we're all going out away from single-use plastic. Those shifts of, of global culture change are massive, driven by social media. I think our responsibility personally within the sector is we have to focus on the bigger picture movements, the movements that happen every hour, every minute of the day, like cargo, people, goods. Personal transport movement Mm -hmm. is really small percentage of the car ownership life. Do you know what I mean? The the life cycle of the car. So because changing our, I, I think if I probably said to my dad, would you share your car with five other people? I think my mum might freak out about sure. what state the car was left in, uh, you know, and, and stuff like that. But so, whereas maybe my kids or and their kids, it's just a it's just a known because by then we'll be on autonomous transport. So you haven't got to worry about getting the car, picking it up from a place. They'll all naturally be circuiting around and and, and being used mm-hmm. autonomously. Autonomy changes how we use cars, changes how we 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 own them, changes how we move. It's a long way off. So I think we have to focus on the bigger transport movements. Mm-hmm. What was it I just read? 81 million people out of Heathrow last year. You know, so, well, imagine if 40 million of those were, were do, on short haul or domestic, anything sub four hours, were doing that in an electric plane or a solar power plane. You know, that carbon debt is mm-hmm. massively reduced. So I think it's about where we focus. The problem with the OEM stuff is, all at the moment, all they're doing is amortizing bad practice and just putting a different powertrain at the end. So that whole how we move, how we digitally twin, where we manufacture cars, what materials we're using, is so vast and it needs a huge amount of legislation work. And that whole uh, that, that supply chain process that you mentioned earlier is a thing just to get known from the OEM side, that the oh, cycle yeah. to build a vehicle, you know, 10 years to, yeah, to build yeah. it and then change the factory. And you know, someone kind of said to me flippantly the other day, oh, well, you know, the OEMs won't start building electric cars because they've you know, got a load of diesel engines to sell. And I was like, well, it's just not that easy to change a factory that builds diesel engines to make you know, electric powertrain. So that's not a thing you can do yeah. tomorrow afternoon, like shut the plant for a couple of hours and change it over. Like that's a thing that takes years and years of planning. I mean, that's what they're now doing in Cowley. You know, they're on a shutdown. It was fakely blamed on Brexit, but they've had to pull their whole summer shutdown forward. I think it's like two and a half, three months to literally recommission the line to produce the electric mini, which is amazing from a BMW perspective and amazing for, you know, where we're based. Mm. But that's three months of not making cars and they were probably producing a car every four to five minutes so that's suddenly a big gap in you know it's a big investment from the areas it's one good thing is they are suddenly having to do massive you know shell outs which is why there's some very interesting collaborations coming up like you know mercedes bmw i just read was it jlr and bmw on stuff battery, talk tech, on yeah, battery yeah. tech yeah. Makes sense. so some stuff happening in uh, asia as well some yeah of the, some, some of the, the stuff we'd have never really, thought yeah, yeah that no one you know oh yeah no one talked to each other and they're like barricade and suddenly everyone's having to talk because there's only so many hv engineers there's only so many software engineers so you've got to share that wealth of knowledge mm. in order for everyone to progress at the same rate and that's why elon musk i guess has done like, like him or hate him you know, he's he's yeah. kind of done what he's set out to achieve really yeah. like even if people don't end up buying teslas in 20 years time he's made everyone move because yeah. everyone's like yeah yeah electric yeah yeah we're definitely yeah it's a hybrid over here yeah, we'll do some stuff you know 15 to 20 years and he's gone right i've done it now yeah. now you have to make you know the pressure will be on model three's yeah. in competing with it it's, if it starts taking sales in the european market like it's taking sales in the u.s market which yeah. it will like, which yeah. it will yeah. like they're gonna have to like they're gonna have to move that along, and that's why they're starting to start to do things that are unheard of before which i think is great the great thing for tesla was they had a blank sheet of paper and they went right if you were to build these from the ground yeah. up and you were to, to, to you know to productize them in mm. in the u.s mm. this is how you do it mm. the bit they're struggling with is scaling that up and who, who better to understand that world than the oem so yeah, yeah. i think that's where we're starting to see some consolidation it'd be interesting to see how tesla play into that new world mm. as well you know i think your point around uh, BMW and JLR, you know, starting to think about, you know, let's do some of that kind of um, consistency across how we do battery technology. Yeah. There will be others in there as well. And we may see some, some full consolidation of some of those big OEMs, you know, behind the sort of services wrap. Yeah, it's yeah, got actually. to be. I, it's a bit like the whole analogy that I think we will just end up with a whole different bunch of skateboards. So it's basically powertrains flat with wheels. Mm. Everything's built into a pod. Mm. Um, and you'll just have different scalability and different tops. And where the OEM can assert themselves in their DNA is their top, mm. their color trim, your materials, etc., richness, cheapness, whatever works. But you'll end up with, you know, one skateboard that can 
a bit like when you're making Lego at home, you know, which I obviously still do. Uh, and you can just expand it up. So you go from more or less, you know, an electric bike with a, a carrier mm -hmm. all the way up to micro mobility. Your saloon car could be three different skateboards. Again, you're just because then you reduce materials, therefore then you reduce manufacturing, you reduce carbon debt. And then actually it doesn't have to be picture. manufactured, then the, no. the the repair and maintenance can be ongoing. Absolutely. You end up with a triggers broom situation. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be the same skateboard for 50 years, it just will have you know 20 new sets of wheels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my favorite analogy for this, but it's because it's the thing, it's like you'll end up with the same, it'll be the same thing, it won't get rebuilt yeah. from the factory, it'll just get new bits replaced all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah predictive analytics, 3D printing, all happens locally. I think the other layer on top of what you're saying, I think is absolutely right in terms of the, that pod on top the other bit will be about the services element mm -hmm. so if you've got a situation where people are just buying a service now so thinking you know, more autonomous or a shared scenario well actually the brand matters less to you yeah. <laughs> you're yeah. just going I need to get from here to here and there's eight of us yeah. I just need to and, I, and I've got 50 quid so I need I'm gonna get this one yeah. it'll almost become that you're not gonna necessarily gonna be thinking about which one do I buy which one do I have like, it's gonna status, be about anything status. Like that. the, the yeah. status becomes about whether you're on the gold package or the yeah. platinum package or the bronze package and you might go oh, I'm on the bronze package I don't care so I'll have this one that's a bit dirty. Because do, do you refuse an Uber because you don't like the type of car that the guy's going to rock up in? No. Because yeah. you, you just get to, in your Uber and you yeah. go. Compare it to the air industry right you know when you when you fly to I don't know Australia you will take um, whatever you know Singapore Air yeah. you don't look at what the vehicle you know whether it's a Boeing or an Airbus sitting behind it and that's yeah. the way we could potentially see yeah. in the future is yeah, you, you choose on based on the service deal yeah. that you yeah. get and you might be a gold you might be platinum but actually you don't care what the vehicle is because about. there's commonality of platform in air there's yeah, commonality right. of platform in train it's just what livery you stick on the outside yeah. and, and how we they have... do the seats or whatever but you yeah, know it's an yeah. A380 oh, Singapore Airlines A380 oh, that'd be exactly nice. and as you say where they compete then is on service offering delivery and then your your experience on the plane which is something we've been horrendous at in automotive for decades. You just, you know, some awful salesperson is going to sell you a car that you're not sure you really want. It turns up, it's a colour you didn't really ask for. You know, it, it, because just as a car, well, and, the salesman and you need won't it. sell you a car. I want to buy a car and they won't sell me a yeah, car. Yeah, or, or even worse, works. when you walk into a showroom, yeah. they don't look at you because they don't think you can afford their car. There's so many horrible preconceptions to that whole dealership model. And that's where I think, you know, the exciting thing of, of companies like, you know, Polestar. So obviously, yeah, you've got Gilio in the back end, and obviously the Volvo relationship, and have just gone, we're never going to have a dealership. We're going to have experience centers and drive out centers. We're going to sell everything and configure online. Because the reality is, is do you really want to be driving to another? Do you remember the days when you go, right, Sunday, need a new car? Yeah. Going to go to five different dealers. Kick some tires yeah, and then and you get to one the out. third one and the third horrible coffee. And you're like, I am done. Like, I don't care what I buy now. You know, I'm going to Skoda. Uh, but it's, um, but there, there is a lot to come, I think. And, but I do think that the focus and the money has to be pushed on where we can make the biggest difference right now. And then when consumers, when we all just see all the time, we're getting on an electric bus, we're getting on a hybrid or an electric plane, you know, our yodel driver was in an electric van on our, on our posties on an electric bike, it will become so commonality that it's not doesn't become a choice because you're just automatically going to buy an electric car but by that point the price I think it is for younger people I was speaking to my 13 year old this morning my daughter and she has no interest in wanting to necessarily learn to drive at 17 18 she wants to be able to book an app yeah. get a car deliver and to take her to where she needs to be and to come home safely so there's there's going to be a shift I think with younger people and the way they look at things now as an advocate I have to say of the haulage industry I think they've actually done quite a bit yeah. they get a hard press but we can all remember the trucks that we've seen up and down the roads where they change the shape of them to make them more aerodynamic. Um, they are now working a lot in networks. Mm -hmm. So rather than having empty back runs, so they've done their delivery and often trucks would then head back to base. They're now networking more between businesses that creates that ability to bring pallets back or to do the back run. And I actually think they've been doing quite a lot about that. They're sharing now, they're sharing some of their business ideas in order to all be secure in business. So there's actually some very positive things in respect of that. But I think there is going to be a shift. I think generally speaking, younger people want something rather instant mm. and several months have taken a driving test. I think those days may be um, fizzling out a little bit, but we have to do our bit. To, um, yeah, to make that more, more common for them. So fossil fuels, you mentioned earlier fossil fuels. Um, you know, is it you know, realistic that there's gonna be a sort of no fossil fuel car by 2040, as an example? Is that actually achievable? 
Yeah, I think it's interesting. We touched on uh, a little bit earlier about the things that you need to impact. Mm -hmm. We talk about it a lot, even when we're talking about shared or or any other aspects. It's it's about focusing on the things that have the biggest impact to start with. Maybe we don't have to say, let's get everybody out. If that getting everybody out of internal combustion vehicles by a certain date is actually then detrimental to the other stuff, it's it's a bit counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. So uh, about focusing on the longer distance transport, focusing on... Um, you know, inner city areas where we can, and actually, if it, if the farmer still needs a four by four pickup that's twenty years defender to drive around the farm, like we shouldn't be banning that if that's the best way for them to do their job, and it's a small proportion of it. So yeah, yeah and the focus so. is really around new vehicles, right? So yeah. let's, it's definitely achievable, but we can't wait another five years until we start putting stuff in in, mm-hmm. in action, right? So you know, regulation can dictate it. That's one thing, but we need to make sure that people have choice. Them. other options of the way they, they travel. So there's the mobility services that we've been discussing, but also around EV um, and potentially other options in the future. So yes, it's achievable, but we need to. there's a lot around it that we need to put in place before it can actually It's happen. not just about legislating that in, not just making internal combustion vehicles so expensive that you have to you know, be forced into an EV. I don't think legislation alone can do it. I think people, businesses, us, the wider industry need to be compelled to make a better offer to the customer to make them switch, along with legislation helping that and other things. But I don't think you can just go, oh, let's just change the rules so we're not going to sell any cars past this point and tough luck of what you get. You know, if, if the infrastructure is not there, if the product isn't fit for purpose, then actually it's not a, it's not the right thing to do. So there should be more focus, I think, on the businesses delivering the right product to make people switch. Um, otherwise, I think that we could be caught in a bit of a vicious cycle. Yeah, and on the fuel side of that, you know. Um, the EV has kind of, you know, the hype around EV has peaked and we're still up there somewhere and mm. it's, still, it's still very good. Mm. But we're starting to see areas like Japan and then sort of the Far East thinking about hydrogen. Mm. You know, that is another, you know, very energy dense um, substance that could be a really good substitute for, for fossil fuels and is clean as well. Okay, and that's big over in Asia. Yes, yeah, yeah. So Toyota um, have had um, a few vehicles out for a, for a number of years now. Um, the Mirai was one that, that came out probably this one, yeah. quite a while ago. Quite a while ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. quite a while. Um, so there's, they're seeing a real opportunity in that. You know, it's very different to operating an electric vehicle. Um, it can, you know, you can get 500 miles out of a, uh, a tank of gas mm-hmm. and fill that up in three or four minutes. Mm. So there is a real opportunity. Yes, there's another shift for infrastructure, but in terms of behavioural change, it's not as big a shift to, to EV. Mm. And again, about picking the, the right things that, that, that it's best suited for. So I think um, right. last week I saw there was the first hydrogen train um, going on, I think, somewhere in Birmingham. Um, and that type of thing, a bit of mass movement of people, is that the better source for it? The thing where you do need a quick fill up versus, you know, my, broadly my commute's 15 miles a day. Actually, I might be better with an EV that I can charge from a solar panel on my roof mm. that I charge three or four times a week, a little bit at a time. That, that suits me best. If you're um, a you know, long distance lorry driver, you know, hydrogen yep. might be the Absolutely. best solution. So again, it's not not trying to pick a horse. So you see that quite a lot of conferences and stuff. People are like, oh no, I'm on, I'm on the pure EV. I'm on the hydrogen. It shouldn't be about that. It should yeah. be about how do we use the best technology to, to solve this problem? I think. I th- yeah, I think it's all about configurators. So I think you, you summed it up brilliantly. I think we will always have ICE vehicles. We will have to because mm-hmm. there are some applications at the moment where you couldn't use anything else that we've got. Right, and then you have to look at the amount it's going to cost to develop that versus what you get back in return. So I I would love to be in a position where we see that we've got hybrid, so hydrogen EV, you've got hybrid ICE, obviously EV, which you've already got now, you'll have pure EV, you'll have pure hydrogen. At the moment, hydrogen is still extracted from dead dinosaurs. So there has to be a way of, obviously, the dinosaur issue is still ongoing. Uh, But it's kind of, you know, we have to make sure the, the planet, well, so the UK is going in a really positive way. I think we keep seeing news items saying we've been two weeks like renewable only, you know, we haven't burnt any coal. That has to get to month on month on month because otherwise, again, we're just building cars and we're still plugging. It's like Formula E. If you go and look around the back, there's big diesel generators powering the cars. You know, it's, <laughs> we, we can't, can't play lip service. If we're going to do this, we do it 110%. We need all the legal support, all the software support. It, everyone's having to collaborate in a way they've never had to before. Like, you know, it, it's amazing when you find yourself at a table talking to energy companies. Like, when do I ever think in my life I was going to sit down and have a discussion with EDF that wasn't about my rate for my home? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because everyone has to collaborate. That's the only way this will move as quickly as the big, bold statements are made by prime ministers and presidents of 
you know, when, when they get to. I think. What's level five? So there's a question here saying, is level five going to be achievable by a certain date? So for those that aren't aware, listening and watching, what's that? Uh, so there's a thing called ADAS. Mm-hmm. So ADAS is Advanced Driver Assisting Assist Systems. <laughs> yep. uh, so there's uh, level one to five. Mm-hmm. Uh, most cars on the road at the moment are around about a two. So if you've got a fairly newish car and you've got reversing beepers and you might have a little thing that tells you when you're in or out of the lane, and they're driver assisting. Um, that moves all the way up to, um, so if you look at a Tesla uh, or a, is it a new Volvo V40, so like pilot assist, where technically you could remove your hands from the steering wheel and it will drive you. That is veering towards like a level three. Uh, and I guess these guys are more pleased to tell you how freaky it is than in four and five uh, and how it's uh, the infrastructure will set up because it's, it's really Well, let's freaky. talk about that. Let's get freaky. So level four and five. <laughs> Chris, Chris, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we always have to say Chris is wearing shorts today under the uh, thing. So and he's flip flops. So it's a warm day. It's a warm day. But come on, let's talk about level four or five. Like, yeah, yeah, I think, well, go on, I'll, I'll let you. Uh, you yeah, start, so um, there's been a race in the industry for a little while to be first to deploy um, fully autonomous, you know, hands off, mm. eyes off the road um, vehicles. Um, four still has kind of steering wheel, there is the, the option to jump in. Um, but level five is turn the seat round, face each other in the car, and the car just just travels. Just becomes like minority report or something like that. That's right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So that and that's um, you know going back two or three years, that's where the hype was around. It's very much yeah, we are going to be the first to deploy this system, and this is the city we're going after. A lot of the conversation industry has now changed as to being, oh no, we're not going to do that by 2021. It's more like 2025. Could be 2026. 30, um, 40. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a lot more focus now around, well, how do we support level three applications, level two applications to support the driver? You know, that's the best way to increase safety of vehicles mm-hmm. is actually provide better software systems around them to make sure that we're, we're reducing kind of fatalities and stuff on the road now. So I think there's certainly been a change in conversation industry from we are going to be fully autonomous in, in five years to, well, let's help drivers now. And then at some point in the future, 2030, 2035, we yeah. can be deploying autonomous. So I was talking to a guy the other day from 5AI, who are one of the oh, kind yeah. of top uh, companies in the UK for autonomous vehicles. And, and he was saying that you know, basically when you get to, I think actually someone um, around the table asked him basically the same thing, for what's level four or five? And he went, level one, two, and three is pretty clear, yeah. as, as you described. Like, when you get to four and five, he's like, uh, like you can't really classify them in that way because the actually what it means you know level being able to drive itself and turn the seat round is fine but in what environment and yep. where yep. you know round closed roads at millbrook this cars are going to do that now right really really easily okay but then when you start to introduce different weather conditions when you start to introduce people and dogs and uh, other things like how does that impact it and uh, so, so it's not as clear as just going oh this vehicle can do it all yeah you know, even yep. the vehicles that commercially are, are working you know the waymo vehicles that are providing some limited taxi services in the us they're doing them on relatively safe roads that were well mapped clean you know proper signposts nice wide roads very quiet you know it'd be different you put them in the middle of new york at, Let's start for sure. So. For sure, we have a different use of the word share, don't we? At the moment, mm-hmm. our roads are sharing with those without autonomous or driver assist systems, and it's going to be some years, in my view, before you you've got all all vehicles on that road all using the same systems. Mm-hmm. Um, at the moment, as a country, you've been very fortunate in a way because there has been that ability to have driverless vehicles tested on our roads because of the way that the laws were were structured. But ultimately, there's also some confusion because we've seen some people that have actually shifted, uh, literally moved out of the driver's seat of a fully autonomous vehicle or a semi-autonomous vehicle into the passenger seat. And of course, they're going to face disqualification as a, a gentleman was last year for doing that for careless driving. At the moment, there's an expectation that the vehicle is operated and somebody's able to override it. So I can see that being five years is very optimistic in my opinion. That we will see. But the technology is good, and it's a thing we, Luke and I, have talked a, a lot about. But the uh, Starship delivery robots in Milton Keynes, yeah. and I've you know, said a million times, I, I'm really lucky that they actually serve the house that I live. I use them all the time. Actually, I've changed some of my behaviour about how I get parcels delivered and stuff to use them. Um, and they're really cool. I can see them from my apartment moving around, and the way they interact with people. And okay, it's, it, there's not well, they are crossing roads, like there's cars and things yeah. like that, that. And that's moved on a lot. There used to be three or four. There's now about forty, yeah. all kind of buzzing around all over the place. So 
the technology can move relatively quickly, but I think that thing where you start putting the most precious of all goods, like people, in vehicles and start traveling them you know, 100 miles an hour on the motorway is going to start. It's a, it's a bigger question than my Amazon delivery at 10 miles an hour on the path. But, but the technology is good. Right? It's, it's, it's really just, impressive. And we're so close to Milton Keynes and, and seeing those delivery is fantastic. If you They started trialing those a couple of years ago. And as they... Walk, drove themselves past your office, people would step out the way, people would be intrigued. Actually, you can watch it now where people are sharing the pavement with them quite comfortably. So another five years from here, we're going to be certainly very used to those. Yeah, so. definitely. And, and that could be another way of, uh, sorry, but that could be another way of the, the things that we talked about earlier on in the session about how do you impact some of the things that are causing the, the biggest issues. You know, is how I get to work the biggest benefit to all autonomous driving. Not, not really, you drive 15 miles, it's not particularly stressful, it's fine. Um, eliminating some of the final mile delivery uh, stuff that's done in very, very big, very inefficient diesel vans, yeah. if they would be able to um, be done, A, giving a better service, because the delivery robots will come on my command at 11 o'clock at night if I want to deliver my parcel when I get home. Um, but actually they're electric and they don't need a driver and all those things. Like, is that a better problem to be solving than how I get to work? And I think it's that thing of how do you apply the technology to solve a, the best problem That's right. in the what, short term? What are the high value use cases that we should solve tomorrow with this sort of technology? You know, we're working on a, a program that works with Addison Leonox Botica in, in London to eventually deliver a commercial passenger service, you know, to help people in underserved areas of public transport plug into the, the existing public transport infrastructure in London. Um, it's, you know, over the next Next three years, we have a series of pilots where we're working with the people of the of the borough, um, with the authorities, with the legal folks, with the insurers, and really having a joined up conversation about you know how do we best roll these things out, you know where where are the high value areas. Um, with the focus on making it easier for citizens to to move around the city, that's got to be the whole the whole point of doing this. Is yeah. you know what are the second and third order effects of delivering autonomy? It's can I save Chris twenty minutes on his commute so he gets to spend more time with his with his family? You know that, they're the sort of stuff that you know we want to be able to do. Um, it's going to take time, but uh, but, the, but the leaders are that taxi companies doing a great deal to really keep up to speed with that and making sure that they're using EVs a great deal. Train companies, well, I've got to take some issue here. They might be planning to have hydrogen fuels and so on, but actually if they actually reduce the ticket price, and that's another topic, mm -hmm. then that would encourage more people to use them mm -hmm. um, when you also slap on £10 a day to park there. Yeah. So ultimately, there are major infrastructures that could do better. There's no question about that. We otherwise have to do everything we can as teams and collabor collaborating to educate those in government, DVLA, DVSA, all regulators in relation to what needs to be done to put that in place Absolutely. to make it easy for everybody. I think the thing that excites me the most about autonomy um, is, and, and having done package studies to get to level five, is there's a whole swathe of disadvantaged people in our country mm. who suddenly can have the accessibility that you and I can have. They may not own an AMG Merc, but they could have access to one. And and for you know people with serious mobility issues who are disenfranchised from just Yes, there might be a, a lift at a station they can get onto a certain train and using apps, you know, being able to follow that whole journey through so they're not having feeling like they're going to have to knock on a station door to get a ramp to the train. Everything can be done through apps. That whole, you know, mass transport, you know, TAS and MAS and all that sort of stuff it is really exciting. And I think that has to move faster mm. than getting to a level five autonomous car. Um, but... If you look at level five from a geomapping perspective, so geomapping is when we can shut down areas so that to allow the, the vehicle to be in a safe environment because, I mean, as these guys working, the problem is there's so many algorithms, the data that these machines are having to clock up and dump out into the ether is massive. Yeah, they're having to think about everything that are, and it makes you realize how amazing humans are, uh, everything that we would think about. You know, if you can get to the point that we've got, you know, an autonomous structure in set areas. So if you look at certain roads, which are high death roads, you know, motorways, the fact that the second you get on a slip road at a motorway, if you're in a level five car, the car takes over. The issue we're always going to have, and I think probably from a legal perspective, is whilst we've still got a bit of everything, mm. it's going to be very hard to insure and, and, and cover people whilst everyone can drive anything. Once everyone goes to level five, I mean, for insurance companies, you will guarantee the death rate will go down. You know, and... You know, it would be phenomenal, but it's a long way off. I mean, we don't even know what our roads look like. We don't even know what our verges look like. I heard a great story in Milton Keynes last summer 
with the heat wave obviously caused by climate issues, um, that um, there was a certain OEM's autonomous vehicle out doing its, because uh, Milton Keynes is a test bed, you've got the Cambridge corridor as well. Um, the grass had gone from green to beige uh, and it started mounting the curb because it had no idea it wasn't, it was the same yeah. you know, piece of ground that it was a week before because they, they're provisions we don't expect. Mm. So you know, we all expect our grass to be green, but suddenly mm. things change and the environment changes. So there's a, that kind of data that has to be passed through the car, you know, through satellites, and you've got issues with satellites and 5G and mm. over the air, and it, it's a massive conundrum. But that, bigger that infrastructure than bit's really interesting as well, though, because I know we talk about infrastructure a lot with VVs and yeah, charge yeah. points and stuff, and I think feel like that's been talked talk to death in various different areas. But I think it's interesting for me about autonomous is about how the government is setting up the infrastructure to cope with them because um, I got heard someone um, speaking at a conference last year and they were saying that the smart motorways that are being put in, um, that you know, each one of those signs, I don't know, cost a million pounds or something, they're going, it's fine because they're there for a hundred years. And you're like, but in a hundred years, the roads are going to look really different. So at what point do, as the highways agency and government, they start saying, well, the stuff that we're building, the infrastructure projects now that are going to take 30 years to complete, we shouldn't be doing them for today's technology. Yeah. We should be doing them for future technology because that would make a difference. If if those smart motorways that were being put in had you know sensors, had yeah. um, you know satellite relays, or you know whatever it, what the technology is that you need, if those were being put in now, it would make it a lot easier to transition. But they've not. They've been built for the driven internal combustion <laughs> vehicle, um, and that that'll be out of date before they're out of their their shelf life. And that transition, like if you just look at the electrification of the GWR line, that transition will you know that transition will cause mass disruption. You know, as you say, every time they have to shut a bit of road to replace a central barrier, yeah. wouldn't it be great if it's got lidar sensors on it, or it's just got color coding or whatever to yeah. pick up points. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of joined up thinking happening within our industry with thought leaders, which is amazing. There are conversations like these that are happening that would never happen mm-hmm. like ten years ago. I mean, can you imagine being an OEM and going, yeah, so we're going to have the software team sitting with the architecture team, sitting with a guy from EDF Energy yeah. and 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 someone from BA, and those conversations would never happen. You're like, whoa, are you going to let me leave my office? You know. Um, <laughs> whereas now. And, it, and it's causing lots of things to come up because autopilot's been on trains and planes for a lot longer than we. You know, so everyone's starting to talk. You know, flying cars are a whole other ball game because then who does legislate them? Is it CAA? Is it VOSA? I mean, who's in charge of a flying car? Um, but it's exciting. I think our children and their children are going to see a change. Yes, children, in transport children, children, children isn't it? It's going to be. Yes. But they, they have. The, but I we mean, get to see you, the cool stuff now. You yeah, take yeah. infrastructure with gantry cameras with with the. And smart motorways, of course, it's from last Monday. In fact, you can now get a hundred pounds fixed penalty. Um, so they have the they have the image um, capturing equipment and all of those things. But you're right; this is something that would have been thought of for the last three to five years, and here it is just getting to this point. Yeah. Industry is already overtaking it, and that's the difficulty. Yeah, it really touch on. Well, and demand, of course. Yeah, gentlemen, lovely lady, I'm gonna have to start pulling this wonderful podcast and video to a close. Before I get onto my final question, which is a question that you don't know I'm going to ask, I've just suddenly thought of one. Oh, very good. Um, <laughs> is, there anything, is there anything within literally a one minute, two minute span, anything else you want to cover off that we haven't sort of mentioned or anything I haven't asked? I just think people just need to be open to what's coming next. But I think the biggest change that you can make that will make a positive difference is the change you can make in the way that you move and the way you travel mm-hmm. and the things that you do at home. Um, don't underestimate how far a little bit of recycling and eating less meat and things like that can can make a big, big difference. Um, It's education. I know, after nearly 30 years in the industry of justice system, that people don't necessarily follow rules. If they're hit with a stick, it doesn't necessarily mean they'll do what they're told. So it is education. It's about getting the younger people and people to learn what needs to be done. Because setting just a set of rules or saying, you will do this, you will do that, doesn't, in my view, always work. Chaps? Yeah, only one for me is, you know, the key sort of rate limiter to a lot of this happening is consumer engagement and and public perception. So there's a challenge to the industry there of go and engage with people and help people understand what the future could be, but also a challenge to the public, engage with this. There is choice there in the future. So engage with it and, 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 you know, help us all deliver the best future. Yeah, yeah. And I think probably that's, uh, yeah, kind of echoing my my views on it, really. I think it's about the industry making compelling propositions for consumers, not just telling them they have to change. And I think we are doing that, but I think we can go a long way uh, and not under and not underestimating what the consumer wants, right? And saying, oh yeah, well, yeah, but what, you know, this person would never share a car. Yeah, well, okay, well, let's give them a compelling reason to share a car. And I think that's uh, um, people don't know what they 
don't know. Yeah. So let, let's make some uh, some good products and services for them to uh, to change how they want to move. Final question. Mastermind session number three is called the future of mobility. So in one word, optimistic, pessimistic, whatever the word's going to be, what one word would you use to describe the future of mobility? And we're going to start with Sally P. Uh, innovative. Challenging. Uh, exciting. Oh, that was my one. <laughs> <laughs> and we won't we won't edit out the bollocks. Exciting. <laughs> okay, so two exciting. Doubly exciting. Doubly yes. exciting. Okay, great. Luke, Luke Russ from Immense Simulations, thank you for coming on the pod. Chris Kirby from Tomorrow's Journey, again, thank you so much. Mike Haywood, my good friend, thank you from Woodfinds for coming on. Sally Pawlecki from Straight Six Designs, thank you very, very much. Uh, I'd like to say a big, big, big thank you to, to David Brown Automotives for hosting us today. You can see in the background some fantastic minis that they're building and converting. If anybody hasn't been here, please visit their website, which will be in the sort of show note links below on the podcast, as well as on sort of YouTube and, uh, and video. My name's Chris Broom from Longhurst. Thank you very much for watching. There will be another Mastermind Sessions number four in the future. I haven't chosen what it's going to be yet. For those listening or, or watching this, if you want to be part of a Mastermind session, Sessions, come and let me know, email or call me again. Details will be in the show notes and perhaps you can be on something like this as well. Thank you very much. The Inside Silverstone podcast is produced by the team at Longhurst for the benefit of those with a passion for all things tech, engineering and innovation. For more information, please visit longhurst.co.uk forward slash Inside Silverstone, whilst also remembering to give us a 5 out of 5 star rating on iTunes. Please note that neither Chris Broom or Longhurst work for Silverstone Park, Silverstone Circuit or Silverstone Technology Cluster.